And let's all stand. Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to get right into the preaching this morning. Matthew chapter 26. Uh, I'll give the announcements at the end of the service, and so I would ask that you please stay around for that after the invitation time, and just a few announcements, uh, but I thought we'd get right into the service right now. Matthew 26, look at verse 47, Matthew chapter 26, and verse number 47, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, behold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hands and drew a sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? And But how then, and I want you to notice this phrase, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? And that's, that's interesting. How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? And it came, in, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple. And you laid no, no hold on me. Look at verse 56. You'll find the, the phrase uh, re referring to the scriptures again. But all this was done that what? The scriptures, it's very interesting, of the prophets might be what? Fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. I'm going to preach this morning on this subject. The scriptures guided Jesus. The scriptures guided Jesus, and I think I can help you, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, and thank you for your love for us. Thank you for giving us a book, and thank you for setting the tone. And God, I ask for your, your, that, 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 that specialness that you give us believers when we are together one with another. Lord, when the psalmist said it is good that we go into the house of the Lord. Lord, I believe that. When I woke up this morning, I thought the best place I could be this morning is in your house. And God, help me to encourage your people today. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. The sermon this morning is going to be very simple. And it's going to come from two phrases that you'll find in verse number 54, but they all, in verse number 56, but they all allude to the same thing. Look at it. But how then, look at it, shall the scriptures be what? Fulfilled. Then look at verse number 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be what? Fulfilled. A lot of people think that when Jesus was born in the manger, that that was his beginning. That was not his beginning. He did not begin his existence when he, be, when, he, when he started his earthly journey on this earth. And people think that as he walked this earth, that he did it from situation to situation to situation. And that when he got to the betrayal in the garden, that he was at the mercy of the events. Please listen to me. That is not true. Jesus did not live life at the mercy of the events. He lived life being guided by the scriptures. Everything Christ did was in fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. I want you to think in terms like this. Christ, when he stepped in, his guardrails to get him down his earthly life on either side were the scriptures. Everything that happened in Matthew chapter 26 was a result of the scriptures being fulfilled. That's very important you understand that. Because if we are Christians this morning and we are to be like Christ, then you and I cannot live life in reactionary mode to where we are reacting to the latest event. We must live life to where the scriptures guide us every single day we live. Over and over again. 
in the New Testament, events happen that were in direct fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. The Messiah would be betrayed. Psalms 41 9. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Messiah's price would be used to buy a potter's field. Zechariah chapter 11. The Messiah would be falsely accused. Psalms chapter 35. The Messiah would be silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53. The Messiah would be spat upon and struck. Isaiah chapter 50. The Messiah would be hated without cause. Psalms 35 and Psalm 69. The Messiah would be crucified with criminals. Isaiah 53. The Messiah would be given vinegar to drink. Psalms 69. Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Psalms 22. Zechariah chapter 12. Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed. Psalms 22. Soldiers would gamble for our Messiah's garment. Psalms 22. Messiah's bones would not be broken. Exodus chapter 12. Messiah would be forsaken by God. Psalms 22. The Messiah would pray for his enemies. Psalms 109. The soldiers would pierce our Messiah's side. Zechariah chapter 12. The Messiah would be buried with the rich. Isaiah chapter 53. The Messiah would resurrect from the dead. Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 49. The Messiah would ascend to heaven. Psalms chapter 24. The Messiah would be seated at the right hand of God. Psalms 68. Psalms 110. The Messiah would be a sacrifice for sin. Psalms, uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Do you know what this means? This means that when Christ was ready to take the next step, he took the next step in fulfillment with the scripture. He did not take the next step going, I wonder if I make the right decision. He took the next step saying, the decision has already been made what my next step will be. You and I are not left without a road map to live life. You and I are not left without a book to tell us how to respond at every given turn that we're at. The wisest thing any Christian will ever do is to let the same scriptures that guided Jesus while he was on this earth, let it guide you every step of the way. It doesn't matter what Bob Gray, the second says it only matters what does God have to say it doesn't matter my rhetoric or my opinion it matters what thus saith the Lord and every teenager needs to know that book right there and every college student needs to know that book right there and every dad needs to know that book right there because you are not left without a step to take or what is the next step I don't know that's not true boy that's not true Jesus fulfilled Scripture. The Scripture already gave him his path to walk. Why didn't he answer at that point in Scripture? You want to know why? Because the book said, don't answer. Why did he say, put up your, your sword, Peter? You want to know why? Because the book said, this is not the time. Jesus walked this earth fulfilling Scripture. Can I beg you this morning? And the sermon's very simple. Is the Scripture guiding your life? When you go to make that next decision, what Scripture is guiding your next decision? I think too many times that we're quick with the keyboard and we're quick with the, with the, with the text and we're quick with everything else. And I don't even think we stop to even consider what does the scripture have to say? Now, please listen to me, dear church. When you start navigating through rough waters in your day, you listen to me. You let the scriptures be fulfilled in your life. You be able to look back and say this. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And when you and I get back to what does the Bible say, what are we going to do about the scripture, then you and I are going to find out that you and I, too, can make it through some pretty rough Waters Here in Matthew chapter 26, and I could go over and over and over and over in the Bible, that how the scriptures would guide you and I. But I'm just going to take this one chapter. Can I do that? I'm going to take this one chapter, and I'm going to give you three guides that the scripture gives us right here in Matthew 26. I want this to be that stepping stone for you. Everybody take a, take a look at Matthew 26. And there are three things here. Now I got to tell you that my sermons are prepared long before I ever get to this point in time. I can't worry about 
yesterday, and I can't worry about preaching something today. I, I've had this sermon ready to go for the last month, six weeks at best. And I can tell you this, that over and over again in the past six weeks, when I have thought about this morning and I have prayed about this morning, I've always thought to myself this, I wonder what other scriptures that I am not even aware of that will guide me through life. I'm going to give you three guides from God's word from just this chapter. Here's what I want to do in your life. I want it to so inspire you that there's a hundred other jewels in that book right there and there's a hundred other truths in that book right there that will guide you no matter where you go. When I give you the three out of Matthew 26, I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk out of here and go, God, I want to know your word so well that I want it to guide me every step of the way. First one, look at Matthew 26 and verse number 6. When, when, I, when I realized that Christ fulfilled the scripture, that the scripture was guiding Christ's step on this earth, then it dawned on me that morning, I was like, boy, that's the answer for everything I have. So I wondered in Matthew 26, what guides are there for me? And there were three of them, and let me give them to you, that I got out of the scriptures that morning. Look at Matthew 26 and verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. And I want you to read the remainder of the verse. Are you ready? And poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Matthew 26, verse 7. And poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, To what purpose is this waste? Read verse 9 with me together out loud. Are you ready? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the what? Poor. Here you have in this chapter, the scriptures guided Christ and his earthly ministry. The scriptures were fulfilled with Christ. Christ said, this is what the scripture says that I am to do. This is what I'm going to do. And he did it over and over and over again. When I studied Matthew 26, I came up with three guiding principles for you and I that I hope are the beginning of many principles. Are you ready? Write it down. The greater good. The greater good. When I saw here, there were two things that could have been done with this ointment. I saw here that there was pouring it on Christ's head or selling it and giving to the poor. Now, I can't read into their motives because I truly believe they cared about the poor. I truly believe that. But I can tell you this. There are two goods here. You have the good of pouring the ointment on Jesus, or you have the good of selling the ointment, getting money, and giving it to the poor. Can I ask you a question? Which one is wrong? They're not. Both of them are what? Good. Both of them are the honorable way to live. But guess what the lady chose? She chose the greater good. She chose the greater good. Please listen to me. In your lifetime, you're going to be, be faced with two goods. Which of the two goods do I choose? You choose the greater good. And the greater good is always centered around one person, and that is Jesus Christ. The greater good tonight is not to go down and give away food to the hungry. The greater good tonight at 6 is to center your life around Jesus Christ. The greater good you could do with 10% of your money is not give it to United Way. The greater good with your money, 10%, give it to Jesus Christ. The greater good of anything that you have to choose, the greater good of uniting with this organization or this, always choose Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is what this life's all about. I think a lot of people think to themselves, well, I could use my talent, use it for the greater good. I could use my money, use it for the greater good. I could use my time, use it for the greater good. If you have to choose between this activity and this activity, and both of them are good activities, but they happen to fall on the Lord's day, choose the greater good and spend that time on Jesus Christ. I think a lot of times we think, well, it's not bad because it's good. Listen to me, but if you have the option to pour it on Jesus Christ and you're not doing it, you didn't choose the greater good. Would Christ have condemned them? No, but Christ would not have praised them 
In fact, I want you to keep look, looking at it, if you don't mind. Look at verse number 10. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a what? Good work upon what? Me. Could you say that at the end of who you are? Has, has your money been used on him? Has your time been used on him? Now, please listen to me. I'm just giving you three. But that scripture needs to guide you and I. You won't know what the greater good is until you know the word. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. You know what I'm afraid? Other than people sleeping through my sermon this morning, you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of the fact that this right here, we don't even read the book, so we don't even know what the greater good is. And that we're using man's thinking of what to do in this situation when God's already told us, let me tell you what the greater good is that you need to do. You and I are not left without wisdom. You and I are left with the wisdom of God's word. And God's word says this, you could sell it and give it to the poor, but let me tell you something greater that you could do with it. And this woman did the greater good. Do you know why we get frustrated sometimes? We get frustrated because the good we do is gone after we do the good. But any good poured on Jesus Christ is lasting. Promise you that. The second principle that I got out of here and that I, that I gleaned from this set of verses, not only the greater good, but look at Matthew 26 and verse 30. Look at it. And this is all centered around. If Christ followed the scriptures, then I need to follow the scriptures. And I'm just giving you three principles from God's word. And that by no means is this exhaustive, but it's the greater good. Then look at Matthew 26 and verse number 30. Look at it. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them all, what's the next phrase say? All ye shall be what? Offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Look at verse 33. And P Peter answered and said unto him, look at it. Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be what? Offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, look at it, yet will I not what? Deny thee. You know what this is? The greater good, number two, you ready? The tough situation. The tough situation. Do you know all of us are like Peter? Going into a tough situation, you know what we always say? I'll never deny Christ. I'll act honorably. I'll never blow it. I'll never turn my back on Christ. That's easy saying it going into a tough situation. But you know what's tough? Is when you get into the situation and you fail. And before any of us condemn Peter... How many of us have stepped up and say, I'll never, I'll be that kind of good Christian. But when we get into the middle of the tough situation, how many times do we fail? You know what the principle of God's word says? The scriptures guided Christ. Let the scriptures guide you. And when you and I face a tough situation, it is not the failure in a tough situation. You know what it is? It's your response to the failure. In a tough situation. Don't ever blame anybody for failing when they meet a tough situation. You don't look at how people respond uh, at, at, at the failing in a tough situation. I want to know what's going to be your attitude after you realize you failed in a tough situation. Go to the very end of Matthew 26, if you don't mind. Go to the very end. Verse 75. Verse number 75. The scriptures guided Jesus. The scriptures is what guided Jesus while he walked this earth. Please, let the scriptures guide you. My, let the scriptures guide you. I'm just giving you three of them today. But it ought to be a passion on the inside of you, never to miss a day. You dads need God's wisdom. You need it. You need it. You mamas need God's wisdom. Everybody needs God's wisdom. And I'm afraid when there's dust on the Bible, there's no wisdom in the head of the Christian you got to get in God's word because look at Peter's response. What are the last seven words? And he went out and wept what? Bitterly. Do you know the scriptures can guide us? Everybody going into a tough situation, you know what we say? I'll never deny Christ. 
I'll always act like a Christian. And then when you get in the middle of a tough situation, you don't act like a Christian. I want to know what happens to your heart when you realize that woke you up, didn't it? I want to know what happens when you realize I didn't act the way I should have acted. You know, you and I are going to fail. We're human. You and I are going to make mistakes. We're human. But you listen to me. If you and I can walk out on the other side of failing with a pompous attitude and an attitude of superiority, then, then, then I don't think that's Christ honoring. At the moment you and I realize we failed as a husband, we have failed in this area, we have failed in this area, we have failed in this area. Can I tell you something according to the Bible? There ought to be a weeping, a bitter weeping and a contrition on the inside that says this, I was not all that I needed to be. Let the scriptures guide you. Boy, if you get one thing out of the day, it ought to be this. The scriptures guided Jesus. When it came to, do I respond? The scriptures said, don't respond. He didn't respond. He was perfect. He learned obedience. He became what we needed him to become. And the only way you're going to become what your family needs you to become is if you know the scripture so well that you are responding to life like the scriptures tell you. The greater good, the tough situation, and then the third principle I glean from Matthew 26 is this. Look at it. Verse 36. Verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. That's how you know that Christ was a southerner. Yonder. Praise God on that one. Here we go. Verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Look at it. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and what? Findeth them what asleep look at it and saith unto peter what could ye not watch with me one hour watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation here it is look at it how many times have we been here the spirit indeed is what willing but the what flesh is what weak the weakness of the flesh can i tell you that you and I in the spirit a hundred times have wanted to serve the Lord. But our flesh is so weak. A hundred times we've wanted to make sure we are who we wanted to be. But the flesh is weak. Please listen to me. You're going to have to come to grips with sometimes your flesh doesn't help you pay attention to spiritual things. That's why we try to keep the air conditioned the way it is. Okay, but it doesn't matter how cold we get it in here. There are some people still snuggled up with themselves right now, and they are fast asleep. Barber chairs and church pews are the two best places to sleep. How many would agree with that, right? I, no, excuse me. Let me give you a third one. Uh, a lady would say a pedicure uh, chair is the best place to sleep. Amen. And ladies, thank you for keeping your shoes on this morning. And uh, can I tell you something? Please listen to me. You and I understand what it is for our flesh to be weak. Classic example, talking about prayer here. Have you ever said, I'm going to pray today? How many ever said that? You got down on your knees next to your bed? And you say, I'm going to pray. And you get, you get in the position that you think is the best position to be in for prayer. And then you think, I'm going to pray. Only to wake up three hours later with drool all over your Bible. And you're like, I so failed. You know, the worst place to pray is in bed. Amen. With the covers pulled up. I'm just going to lay here and I'm going to pray. That's the worst place to pray. Why? Because your flesh will take over. Please listen to me. The scripture will help you with your flesh. Now I said all that to say this. I used three examples. I used the greater good. I used the fact that you and I have to face a tough situation. And then I used the fact, the fle- the fact that the flesh is weak. Now listen very closely. That's just three 
in one chapter. Can I ask you a question? Is the scriptures guiding you today? How much Bible are you reading to where you're coming up with the scriptures maturing you? And you're walking according to the scripture. If I asked you a situation, could you give me a scripture? If I gave you a circumstance, could you give me a scripture to pull you through? I think a lot of times that, that you and I don't rely upon the most precious gift that you and I have ever been given, and that is the Bible. You and I have been given. Man, get the kids to read the book. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, and I'll end with this. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Out of the verses in the Bible, there's probably a, a top four if you don't mind, that I really love. My favorite verse, Romans 5, 8. I love that verse. You get to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the word of God is what? Read it with me. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and what? Intents of the what? Heart. There's only one that can figure you out, and that's God's Word. That's it. How much Scripture have you read today? How much Scripture have you read this week? What does your Bible look like right now? What does your study Bible look like right now? I don't think it's sacrilegious. I don't think it's sacrilegious to take God's Word and to underline things that mean something to you. This past week was my birthday, and my wife got me a card, and on the card, she took the card, and she underlined a couple of words in there that meant a lot to her. Uh, money. Um, <laughs> credit card. <laughs> and uh, she underlined some words in there that meant a lot to her that she felt like meant a lot to me. And it would mean a lot that she underlined it. Can I tell you something? Make that Bible a love book. And when you sit down and read it, there ought to be something that jumps off the page that you go, oh my, that is great. Amen. I'm preaching to the teenagers tonight, young fundamentalists, the fear of every parent. And when I was studying in Deuteronomy about three or four weeks ago, I came across just a little bitty phrase that I thought, Oh, if the teenagers just knew, that's the fear of every parent. You know what? I said, thank you, God, for giving me that for the teenagers. Amen. You and I better start letting this book guide us. When Christ came to this earth, Christ was not guided by what he wanted to do. He was guided by what the scripture said from the Old Testament. He fulfilled scriptures let me put it this way are you ready i'm gonna put the bible watch this i'm gonna put the bible out there the bible has already gone ahead of you and it's already told you what the next step is that you should do Amen. it is already out there it is a living book it's alive it's an errant it's inspired Amen. and it is so alive it will already tell you. The verses you're reading today is preparing you for the thing you're going to face tomorrow. The verses you don't read today is you're missing the truths that are you're going to stumble because you don't have the knowledge. Boy, let it sink down deep into you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask for your blessings now.